go. Tom, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you on because I know that you are just such a wealth of knowledge in this area and we have spoken before and we have very similar stories with how anxiety has impacted the two of us. And I suppose the place I want to start is if you had a message that you wish more people knew about anxiety, what would that be? <sighs> Georgie, you throw me right. I love it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, oftentimes I try to think about what would have helped me the most. I think if I had have changed my perception, if someone told me, okay, that your anxiety is a signal and it's trying to tell you something, uh, that would have changed my whole journey because for, for at least three, four years, I was looking at it, um, you know, through a scope of a mental health issue, you know, and, I, and it was a management strategy protocol that I was, you know, trying to observe. But if someone had told me, um, you know, it's a signal, it's trying to tell you something, I would have perhaps moved down the more psychoanalytic, reflective mode of thinking um, to try to look at the, the root cause. Uh, so that would be my answer. Yeah, I love that. Instead of just looking at it like there's this malfunctioning issue that you have, you have this condition called anxiety and your brain doesn't work as well as other people's brains or those other things we assume. It's like, no, it's, it's your brain's doing its normal job in response to life and what you're trying to manage here. Exactly. Yeah. If, if I could have just had been told that, you know, it's just that I, yeah, exactly what you said. What's it trying to tell you? It's there for a reason. You know, you're not, you're not um, broken or anything. There's something going on in your either internal, external or a combination of both life that uh, is, is uncertain and is, is, is causing you some kind of fear you know, let's have a conversation about that. And I probably would have been able to just go off on a list. And obviously then the the next way of thinking is, okay, well, how can I rectify these issues? And I just see it almost from a practical basis. You know, it's like, okay, to the degree that I've reconciled a lot of these issues that I have around uncertainty is the proportional degree that I probably feel less anxious. You know, I found that in my own life and in, you know, my studies and things. And um, if we can just see because it just gets roped up into this anxiety and depression thing. And I don't know if they do us any good. I mean, anxiety is kind of like a biological term. Depression, depression is grief, depression and grief. Their symptomatology is literally like this lined up, you know, and um, it's a shame, you know, without moving into too much of a tangent that, for example, you know, over a third of parents in the U S statistically speaking are medicated after they lose their, their children in some kind of traumatic accident. They don't need medication necessarily. I'm not going to just throw out the baby with the bathwater, but they need to grieve, you know? And if you take away that seriously important response to trauma, you take away their ability to develop. So that signal idea is really profound. Yeah, absolutely. Like we are giving, we, we can so easily attach to these labels and then from that, think that we are flawed. But every human mind in the right conditions can go down and decline in their mental health. It's like mental health yep. is not is is a bar, a barometer that we all have and it can be high or low and it fluctuates throughout life. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it would have been good to know that, Georgie. <laughs> yes. Okay, so that was the answer to the first question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Wait, well, how do we get there? Um, yeah, okay. for sure. Now, Tom, you're so passionate about mental health and, and anxiety and, and obviously from the journey that you've been through yourself, can you enlighten us on what that was like for you? How did you get to this place where now this is such a, you know, part of your work and how you help other people? Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, first off, I, I never wanted to be in this world, you know, um, I think you and I kind of have that, um, you know, on the, on, on par there. Um, you know, I wanted to be an AFL player growing up. Um, that was my inspiration. You know, it was an, it was an, it was a need for external validation upon reflection, but AFL was my world. That was my identity, you know, and I'm so interested in identity and how multifaceted and layered it is because how could something like kicking a football literally be who I was, you know, but I mean, I think I was, um, always kind of a 
you know, a bit of a jumpy kid. Uh, you know, my first memories are um, fear based. Uh, you know, I was, I went to the, uh, I went to the bathroom and um, my, you know, a friend of mine were jumping on the trampoline outside and I couldn't wait to get out there. And, um, you know, obviously I had to go to the toilet. So I had to have time with my thoughts and my first memory is kind of a panic attack because I remember looking at my hands and thinking, how did I get into here? Like, how did I get into this body? And I, I don't know how old I was, but shortly after that, I started, I started writing when I was about four years old. And um, the first like major piece I wrote was a 10,000 word essay about a kid with depression and his, his parents were moving through a trauma. And I don't think that's kind of normal for a 10 year old kid, not in a good way as well. I'm not trying to use that as like, oh, go me. It's like, I had some issues. <laughs> 10,000 words? Yeah, well, I found it about a year ago and start and reread it, and it was it was just over ten thousand words. So um, it was in two thousand three. So I was born in nineteen ninety three, and um, the date was was in two thousand three. And um, yeah, it was interesting reading back on it because the protagonist was a was a young fellow named Peter Reynolds, and his life was just getting worse and worse. His parents died in a fire accident. He was living with his grandparents. He was bullied at school, and he couldn't find his place in the world. But I think abstracting out. I've always been interested in how to find meaning because I've been so confused as to how we, we are alive in a world we don't know, you know, um, metaphorically speaking. And that, that has plagued me for my whole life, you know, and I became very engrossed in this idea that I was going to become an AFL player and it was who I was, you know, literally people knew me. I I would sleep with a football in hand, you know, and um, anyway, I did okay. I, tried my luck down in VFL and um, it was like halfway through the season in 2013 and I got cut and I didn't know what would happen, you know, at the time. And I paid no attention to the fact that they said, you know, we'd like, you know, we think you're okay. We'd like you to come back. Um, I just paid attention to, we won't be offering you a place this year. And I didn't know, like I said, that my identity was AFL. So when that was stripped, it was the, you know, the, the fall, the cliche fall carpet pulled from beneath your feet. Who am I kind of thing. And, you know, when your ego is no longer sailing, um, the unconscious waters can really start to stir, even though they've been there the whole time, you just haven't been looking. So the river overflowed and all of these traumatic experiences, um, you know, just kind of funnel in from nowhere. Um, and that led to the manifestation of obsessive compulsive disorder and, um, and panic disorder. So I had all these very bizarre thoughts come out of nowhere that wouldn't leave me, you know, from the moment I woke up to the moment I fell asleep, questioning my sexuality, you know, questioning what I, how I would, um, go to hell perhaps and, and burn eternally questioning why I wasn't already schizophrenic and I would, that I, I couldn't, that, and that I was hearing voices and seeing shapes moving that no one else could see and that everything that I saw was um, coming from my own consciousness and I was trapped in this world. And, you know, so, like lots of other weird things um, that I wrote about. But the compulsions were really interesting as well because the compulsions led to a need for certainty to prove those that those thoughts weren't valid. And to to move from a place of AFL is my life, you know, two months later to having these kind of thoughts and compulsions, I just thought I went insane. Um, And it was very scary. How old were you (laughs) at that point, Tom? 21. I was 21. So it was in 2014 when kind of that all really happened. And um, that's a point of life where you're really trying to work out who you are anyway. And so to have your whole identity of what, what you were able to cling to at that point of your life taken away from you, it, yeah. Obviously cleared the way for what I imagine was a kind of awakening, but you went through, you know, literally hell and back to, to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting. Um, this is a very kind of mythological idea that, um, you know, this is a hero's journey type idea, a hero or a heroine's journey. We don't even use those words anymore, but that idea that, something that can fundamentally change your life is um, can be willingly embraced or, 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 or you can be involuntarily exposed to it. And, you know, the case I make in the book that I'm writing is that, you know, a, a mother of two, a, um, you know, um, she's been married for 20 years, comes home and she finds that her husband's cheating, cheating on her. And 
what that does to the psyche, you know, and how, because obviously you get this immediate detachment from who you are and who you think you are and who you think you've been for make the case I make is 20 years. For me, it was 21. You know, I didn't know that I want to be an AFL player at zero, but um, that whole idea and just kind of how to deal with that. Because then there are other people out there that go and face the unknown and face fear willingly. And that, and then that, that leads to a, a shift, you know? So it's kind of like I could um, go and, you know, like, do something that I didn't think I was capable of. And then that kind of starts to shift my whole belief system in its entirety. It's like, well, what else are, am I not, am I not aware that I can do? But when you're, when the carpet's pulled from beneath your feet, that whole, who was I, was I ever anyone was the whole world lying to me. It's enough to make people go insane. And there, there are, there are lots of studies that have a look at the, Um, you know, the causal links between kind of psychosis, mental health issues in response to some kind of external traumatic event that you didn't seemingly think you had any control over, but you're you're totally right. Yeah. So what steps did you take from that point, Tom? Uh, Well, (laughs) the the first things were just mere distraction, um, trying to get out of my head. Um, So it was, I, I moved into CrossFit straight away and I was just beating my body up for hours um, you know, hiding behind the guise of this is productive and this is making me healthier. Um, it was re- like really just re- like just releasing a whole bunch of cortisol through the body. But in my, my idea was that, you know, if it's an hour, an hour out of my head, then, it, then it's good. Obviously you want to go about that in a productive way, but it, it was just um, going out and partying on drugs, um, doing CrossFit and then, you know, for me, my addictions were interesting. Like I had a very interesting addiction to um, food and then porn a little bit as well. It wasn't a severe one, but it was more, more or less, I need something to get out of my head, which also kind of moved into an obsessive compulsive issue there as well. So the initial stages were very much just like, get out of my head, get out of my head, get out of my head. Um, Cause I didn't want to be in there, you know? Um, the, the, and then, as I started to move through that, I think it was starting to, okay, this isn't going anywhere. Um, I probably, and this wasn't linear either, you know, it's just a big circle of things, but therapy initially. And then I was very lucky that, you know, 2014, obviously we had the internet. Then I I, I used YouTube and, and audible and started to try to teach myself a bit more because only, you know, the true nature of your own experience. And, um, initial research was very much reassurance that I wasn't, that I somehow wasn't changing, you know, that I wasn't going to go to hell, that I wasn't going to um, develop some kind of uh, chronic psychosis. But um, yeah, so I had to move away from the reassurance, but it eventually became, okay, I need to understand what's going on with anxiety. Yeah. And as a man reaching out for help and Mm. going for therapy, did you find any kind of a resistance within you to that? I was really lucky. You know, I grew up with, um, um, a really well-rounded father. Um, he was quite anxious, um, as a kid actually around the same time, but I had a really strong relationship with dad. My mom, my mom was, um, very assertive, very strong willed. I never felt the stigma. Um, I always, my mom was the first person I spoke to when I, when I was struggling with this, you know, she said it might be a good idea to journal and then just, just books and books and books of writing came out. But I was lucky with that. You know, I've, I've spoken to fellas that have really struggled, you know, because they, they're attached to this idea that men shouldn't open up, you know. Yeah. Um, my identity was attached to AFL, not necessarily that around ideas of stereotypical masculinity or manhood or anything. So I was actually really lucky with that, yeah. That's, that's awesome that you, that you had that support. But for someone who, you know, I, I imagine some of the men that you work with too, before they make that call to like reach out to work with someone like you. Yeah. There's something that you would say to them to help them make that step. Yeah, for sure. My, my um, therapy approach is a little strange. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like, you know, light, lightheartedness initially just to help validate people. Um, because sometimes when you're talking about these things, the inclination and the presuppositions are are just very negative and very deep, you know, all that sort of stuff. 
Thank you, Siobhan. That's very nice. My partner just bought me some Tim Tams and coffee. Look at that. How good is that? <laughs> I know, one there. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, yeah, the, the, the presuppositions around that idea um, can be very deep and negative. Oh, you know, they've got depression. Oh, it's a man who's got depression. What the fuck? You know, look at this guy. Um, you know, one thing that I like to do is just to say dumb things like, oh, do you have a brain? You know, they're like, well, yeah, of course I've got a brain. It's like, well, do you have a fear center in the brain? And, and then we start talking about how the brain's set up and wired to literally um, just be on alert for anything that's potentially dangerous all the time. I just, I believe that the fundamental state of the human being is in a mild state of anxiety provocation to be aware, you know? So that's like, if they're going through an issue and there's anxiety prevalent, it's kind of like, okay, at least you're normal you know yes oh my god that's such a good way of looking at it i mean it's how yeah. how the human species has survived that's the one yeah that context is insane when i first started studying evolution it i i felt one with the world you know yeah it's like those of us who know anxiety well it's like we're actually the best survivors so so true exactly yeah exactly right it's like okay cool all my ancestors who were like really dumb and hairy they chose not to jump off that mountain and have sex what a win <laughs> yeah exactly okay so you started working through your own understanding you did a lot of research yourself started um you know writing and all of these other things for for you i imagine it was the was the original purpose of that oh uh, yeah selfish initially for sure yeah which i think well we all do i mean we're all trying to understand ourselves and then when we move through our pain and we learn a lot about how we can overcome that or how we can manage it at least we then the next inclination is to go and help people and serve people you know certainly my absolutely story. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Well, you really helped me when you spoke um, about about your story. You know that that idea that even that can kind of change your perception just added another layer of certainty into my own world. Um, that was my favorite part about show, actually, George. It was it was really good. Yeah, and um, so looking at how you went from sort of writing and sharing and 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 going through therapy. What was that road like to get to a place where now you don't have those thoughts and you don't feel that way and you feel more in control of the world most of the oh, time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, most of the time. Yeah, I've got other thoughts now. <laughs> um, I think the – oh, that's such a good question. God, what was that road like? I mean, it's so hard because as a therapist, you want to kind of help guide your clients through that road. But the irony is that the road itself is paved with so much uncertainty. You know, it's so much like you read a book, you're like, Oh my God, I'm fixed. And then two months later you feel like you're worse and you're like, Oh my God, was that whole two months worth nothing? And then you read the book again and then it perhaps doesn't talk to you. And then you read another book and then you talk to someone else. And then it, it, like, it's, if I, that's such a good question. That road for me was guided by the fact that I didn't want to be who I was. So anything that wasn't helping me even a little not be uh, who I was or get slightly better kept me pushing forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you had that underlying determination driving you. Like it's, it's got to be, there's got to be something more than this. Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly right. It was just, I, I couldn't understand how my life had become so bad so fast. Um, and actually I should, um, you know, it wasn't my life. It was just my perception of myself and my reality. Um, cause my such life was good, pretty good. Yeah. Such a good distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was our stories. So, you know, it's like, what the hell's going on? Everyone's happy family. The world's going well. There's no wars. I get it. I have a job. Like I shouldn't be feeling like this yet. I'm, struggling you know so i think that road for me was um i wasn't necessarily determined but i well i mean i could you could say i was determined not to be in that much pain so pain was the motivator i wasn't trying to necessarily get to a better place i just was trying to really get away from a place mm. yeah do you feel like 
This is a question that came up when we spoke last time. We talked about trauma and mm. how that plays into it all. Do you feel like, in a way, you being cut from the AFL was a trauma? Absolutely. Absolutely. Trauma is a subjective experience, you know, um, because the body interprets experience subjectively, you know. So, oh, thanks. Um, so one of the things that, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists have done a really great job in the last half of the 20th century has been deciphering how the brain responds to traumatic experience. And, you know, they have a look at the same areas. So this is from a neuroscientific standpoint, but they look at the same area that, that highlights in response to when, you know, um, you're triggered by the fact that someone said you were ugly when you were four or when you were cut from an AFL team as comparison to someone who's a victim of sexual abuse or has been to war and seen horrific things because that brain person a hasn't been to where person B has been, but they know what pain feels like because we are wired as we said before to get away from that stuff. So anything that is, you know, even a little bit associated with what, and I, I think the definition of the trauma is a fear inducing event that led to a self limiting belief because it's not necessarily trauma. Isn't necessarily something that was physical, but it changes our perception of self and our reality and the traumatic experience stays disintegrated in the past, you know, unintegrated in the past. And this kind of therapy is, is, you know, what we want to do is kind of bring that with us so that, that pain and that belief there, there's, you know, there's no difference there anymore. It definitely was a traumatic experience for me. It was, it just happened to be a really good one because I happen to really love my life now. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's led you to this point where you've been able to learn so much about yourself. And I imagine it's pretty fulfilling being able to help people on this journey too. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really is because, um, and one thing that I have to work on is I love looking, going really deep, you know, studying, you know, you and I are quite similar like that, really knowing what's going on in the brain, how do belief systems occur, like the depth of it. Someone out there who's really interested in fire trucks, you know, doesn't really want any of that shit. They're just interested in having a, their life back, you know, but because we are so obsessed with that, it's like, cool, we're just here to give you what you need to know do that and you're off, you know, and obviously it's not that simple, but um, it has become a passion for both of us. Totally. I love that definition you gave for trauma before being an experience that terrifies us basically that then leads us to a, a limiting belief about ourselves or that sense of, you know, shifts our whole perception and we stay stuck in that, in that belief. And they can be so, so hard to shift when someone Mm. is working through trauma with you yep. what kind of process do you take them through to start to approach that story in their mind from a safe place and start to unravel it yeah it, it's it's again it's multifaceted and oftentimes you have clients that come to you that don't necessarily recognize that they are the victims of traumatic experience, even though we all are because we all live in this world. And at some point in our life, we are exposed to something that we didn't know existed. You know, nine 11 was massive for me. That's just one example. Um, but uh, when someone approached, I imagine what's that? Sorry. We weren't in New York. I imagine when that happened. No, no, I wasn't exactly. You're totally right. But I mean, yeah. the trauma for me, because I was so young and so attached to my mum necessarily was, looking at my mum watch the TV and wondering why my mum was frightened of the TV, you know, because yes. my age there, you know, shit happens all the time that I didn't know happened, you know, and that, and then I learned more about the world. I didn't know that it wasn't normal for planes not to go into buildings, but for what I could gauge on mum's face, that was a really uncommon thing. And I was really scared and I had lots of nightmares about it. Lots of nightmares. And, um, I couldn't get over it, you know, but I suppose when someone approaches you, um, the first thing you want to have a think about is where are they and what's a place they would like to be. And I think it's necessary to do trauma work for contextual purposes to give people a little bit more insight and self-awareness as to why they are the way they are. But if we can, um, 
you know, we don't necessarily always have to go back into the past only to the degree that the past is withholding them from, from taking that chain, making, you know, that next step. Sometimes it's just like, okay, practicality purposes, we need to get here. We need to change some things in our lives and our structures. When over processed sessions, we start to realize that there is something holding them back, you know, and this is if they don't know, um, I find journaling really helpful. And there's some really interesting research that came out of um, the university of Austin, Texas about journaling in the ninth, in the 20th century, the eighties. Um, they found that journaling about um, traumatic experience led to better immune health, you know, things like mm-hmm. that. So that's really, it's really interesting, but just getting it out, you know, like a cathartic process Yeah. when you're, when you're doing that, the analogy that I use is because you're going into unconscious waters here. You want to tie yourself to a stable tree on the bank so that you can sift through the unconscious waters without the water taking you away. Because in that world of interpretation, like, you know, similar states you get into when you meditate or, you know, when, when that kind of starts to overflow so many things come up, you know, was that traumatic? Was that traumatic? Oh my God. You know, cause it's so hard to process. So I find journaling to be a really great way of keeping the rope tied to the tree because you're the one writing the, the words. So you write the word and oftentimes people, you know, I give guidelines to my clients and you know, sometimes they'll write things and the first thing they'll say is like, Oh, I had a great childhood, you know? And then, so it's like, Oh yeah, but then this experience happened. And then by the end of the page is like fucking tears on the page and yeah. they're just going at it because it's like one thing leads to another and then you find oh wow that was a really really painful experience and um so that's like some of the processes we use i suppose journaling and then just speaking about for the first time in their lives sometimes how that affected them you know because we don't get that chance especially in this day and age yeah that's so true why do you think it is that because i am such a fan of journaling and i love getting my clients to journal too um Mm much to their, you know, pro- protests sometimes. Um, <laughs> yep. But I, well, like, uh, my theory on it is that when we journal, we are not only, we're writing down our thoughts and we have an opportunity to then see them outside of ourselves. So we have that other perspective on our thinking. Mm. We just can't get when we're just all up in our head. Um, and the other thing is, you know, no one else is necessary. Like, you could write whatever crazy stuff you want no one's going to read it like it's yours yeah what do you think it is about journaling that's so useful compared to say me like if i'm writing down my story and journaling my story about my childhood instead of just telling it to you well yeah it's such a good question i i I, um really agree with both of your um perspectives and i I probably agree even more with your first perspective because i'm interested in what goes on in the brain in response to traumatic experience one of the reasons why trauma comes up in nightmares all the time is because there's so much fear trapped around the experience that um the nightmare comes out as a way to try to emotionally regulate the experience to pull the fear away from it so that we can actually re-narrativize it and integrate it into our lives and why I think journaling works is because let's just say I'm, I'm a day one client and I've come to you and I, you know, something really bad happened to me when I was eight years old. The way I talk to you, you'll just feel my fear straight away. And you, I mean, we both know what goes on in the brain when fear is present that, you know, the, the part that's responsible for putting um, thoughts to words shuts off completely. You know, this is um, broker's area in the PFC in the brain. And I think what journaling does is that it gives you the time to process the thought and the word so that you're almost like overriding the quick, quick impulse fear. Don't have time to think, got to get away from the tiger reaction and and slowing it down so that you actually can perhaps for the first time um, put words to, to, to the experience. And that's the hardest part, you know, is like, how can I say, what something made me feel Mm. journaling i think allows that yeah yeah it's like allowing that ability to express and we got time to to think and allow those thoughts to come that those words to come through um terms of us and and this is assuming that there is a you know we know that in 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 healing 
there is no end point, right? There's no destination. We never get to that point where we're just healed and standing on top of the mountain and life is easy. All the way <laughs> yeah. um, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, but in terms of getting to a place, say from where you were two months after being cut from the AFL to where you are now, where you mm. are doing really well, you could say thriving in your life most of the time. Obviously, we all have our ups and downs. Um, getting to that place where we are, we have good a good mental health. Do we need to delete these traumas from our brains? I think they become because you know human beings are meaning making machines, and I think meaning comes from um, the burden and the challenge and the weight of an experience that taught you something about yourself. Now that's towards the end of trauma therapy. You know, we're not going to say this is the best shit that ever happened to you day one, you know, but towards the end of it, you really start to have a think about how it shaped you for the better because it led to the cultivation of huge self-awareness. And then now it's like, okay, what do we want to do with all this awareness of self and the world? My, understanding of it would be to start having a think about a vision for your life. You know, what is a really desirable end goal? Who do you want to be in six months time, a year's time? You know, do you want to have a family? What kind of job do you want to have? Like what, what, what kind of day it sounds cliche would, um, would excite you to get up in the morning, you know? And I think a lot of the times I've found this is kind of like an, 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 an alchemical idea is that, our deepest pain leads to our greatest sense of purpose, you know? And then obviously the Buddhist idea is that the lotus flower grows from the mud. This is a very old idea that our deepest pain is, is often the thing that we attach the deepest meaning to um, initially for the right reason. Cause like you, we, we think we're going to die when we that experience, but then it's like just the mere fact that, you know, we, we can, we can live through those and keep pushing is just an incredible sense of self gratitude. So reintegrating it, re-narrativizing and then deciding on some kind of intrinsically meaningful vision um, is kind of how I go about it. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, you know, the way I see it too, Tom, is that every time we go through a traumatic experience and, you know, if for those who are listening, if you haven't grasped yet the idea that a trauma isn't just physical violence, sexual violence, these things that we tend to associate with trauma. Trauma can be literally, you know, that an argument you had with someone that terrified mm. you because mm -hmm. they were judging you for your deepest insecurity, you know, and it was just a word, but that yep. could be trauma, you know, and, and those experiences we've highlighted. But each time we go through one of these traumatic experiences and we all do, it's like a little part of our ego dies and sometimes a big part of our ego dies, um, our understanding of ourself and our identity and who we are. And in that absence, in that space, we then get to fill in the blank and grow into something new and, and evolve and grow. And like, this is, this is what we're here for, isn't it? Like <laughs> to, yeah. to have grow. an experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, that, that makes me think of the story of the three little piggies. Where in the first part of the tale, they're just, you know, innocent, ignorant little pigs and they build a shitty house and the chaos comes and blows it down straight away, you know, in terms of the wolf. But by the end of it, they're strong and assertive and they build this like brick fort. And, you know, the, that represents the ego. You know, the more pain and trauma we go through in our lives, the stronger the house is to withstand that. And then where the meaning comes into it is like, well, maybe we can help other people and they can come inside our house and, and we can help them. And um, we can, yeah, that, I don't know if that has anything to do with the actual tale of the story, but it's a good idea, I suppose, of the ego. Is that just something you like had, like were thinking about in terms of that story? I mean, who would have thought the three little pigs? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a weird way. Yeah. I, I don't know why I thought of the three little pigs then, but when you were speaking about kind of like how the ego goes through changes, it yeah. made me think of the way the the the, the piggies like never gave up and they, they learnt from they that's the big thing. They learnt from every failure. And that's something that I think we can take on as well. Like if our ego was like a little sand castle, you know, the first time we build a sand castle, it's a piece of shit little sand castle and a small little wave takes it and blows it over. Well hopefully as we keep learning, we build better sand castle and we put a bit of rock in there and a bit of wood and you know, eventually a massive wave can come and that sandcastle is still strong. It's because we've learnt from 
the chaos and uncertainty of the world. I love it. I love that analogy. That's so, so good. And it's like, I think back to, you know, the things, this is where, this is where the value of trauma for those, I mean, for people who just have just gone through something traumatic and you're just in the pain of it, you know, don't even try going here yet, but you can think about other past traumatic experiences you've had where you can see how they did build onto who you are as a person. And honestly, some of the things I'm most proud of myself for and the characteristics about myself that I love the most are because I went through hard stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. And, you know, if we wanted to come full circle and start talking about evolution again, you know, we, we wouldn't have got to 2020 unless we were a very highly adaptive, strong, um, you know, species and to throw all that out now because we can press a button and, and, and have food arrive at our door is to throw our sense of evolutionary meaning. You know what? I mean, how fulfilling would it have felt to hunt, kill, and then provide, you know, um, just, just, just that collective sense of, Hey, we're all in this together. We all need to help each other out. I'm going to do something scary here. I'm going to do something scary because it's for a purpose, you know? And, um, it's a very old idea that if you have a why you can move through any how. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I get lost in, in how thrilling these are, these concepts are. <laughs> but what I love about that is the empowering idea that we have these strong survivors within us. Like that is your DNA. That is in mm. who you are as a human, you're all of our ancestors. We've evolved from the ones that were strong and smart and survived. And you get yeah. to take that with you into you know life's hard i think we just have to sometimes acknowledge that life comes with hard times life comes with traumatic experiences and not to attach to a label about oh that was my trauma and i've had this trauma yeah. and therefore I'm, I'm messed up like you've got your trauma so does that person so does that person we all have our own to varying degrees but they do the same thing to our minds as we've kind of yep. <laughs> discussed yep depending on depending on your perspective and, and what you've lived through and you know this these when we start to realize that that's just what life comes with we are equipped to go through those challenges mm, we are equipped yeah. deep into our dna yeah yeah i think it's a dangerous game to start playing you know i had it worse than you because a you're not getting anywhere and b it leads to a separation um, we're lucky that we went through the same thing so, you know, we've, we've got that, um, that similarity there anyway, you know, um, but, uh, I think you're exactly right, Georgie. I think it, it needs to start being looked at as, um, and you know, one of the arguments I make in my book is that I, I feel like despite what it may have began as, you know, with like positive psychology coming, you know, after psychoanalysis, um, this pursuit of happiness idea is, is really dangerous because it, it can lead to expectation mm -hmm. and also a falsehood because, you know, we're not meant to be happy. We're meant to be happy a little bit when we're really hungry and you know, we eat food and then eventually we're not hungry anymore. So where we got our happiness from, you know, it's like a, um, what is it? It's like if you're really thirsty, a glass of water is really is your sense of happiness. If you're really hungry, it's a burger. It'll change all the time. You can't, you get that keep grasping idea won't work. But mm. what, what is going to get us through the ups and downs? You know, like what's going to, I mean, like you have a relationship. What if, you, if you're pursuing happiness, the first fight you two have, it's like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was. It's like, well, well, we're married now and we have kids. What are we going to do? You know? So like it's a, I feel like it's a meaning thing. Like if you can look back on your life and your endeavors and go, I really, that was worth it, you know? Yeah. How do we find that? That's going to be good. Yes, that's so true. Instead of just, how do I get my happily ever after? Exactly, yeah. Well, those tales finish at like, okay. I don't know. I was chasing happily ever after when I was like 15, you know? Those, those Disney stories never come with like, okay, well, what about kids? And then, okay, well, what about visas? And what about moving house? And it's just like, no, no, the story stops when you get the kiss. Really? <laughs> But I was so shit at kissing then. <laughs> <laughs> or it's I like, still am. <laughs> if I just become the AFL player, like then I'll be happily ever after. That's exactly right. Like what I was chasing and I didn't even want to be, I was like, once I became an AFL player, then I'll get all the girls, then I'll have all the money, 
you know, and obviously I loved AFL at the same time, but it was so, um, it was so externally validated. That, that was my biggest lesson. Mm, yeah, that's so good. So, Tom, I've got another couple of questions for you. Yes. Just to finish us up, to round us off. Um, the first one is when you feel that anxiety come on, those anxious thoughts start to come over you, what's something that you can tell yourself in that moment to bring yourself back to a, a place of feeling more calm? Yep. So two things I do. The first thing, the first thing I do is um, I greet them. and I you know, ask them why they're here because they might be there for valid reasons. You know, I'm like, okay, I actually need to sort that out. Um, if they're not, then I get out of my head and into my body. So I, I, I will do um, two minutes of as many burpees as I possibly can, or I will jump into a cold shower and I will not breathe hard. So I'll embrace the challenge, but in a physiological way, because what I find is that when I'm anxious and I'm anxious for no reason, it's probably because I have too much energy or I've just had a coffee um, and I just need to get into my body. I think if you stay up here for too long, um, A, we're not wired to be that way and B, it doesn't serve you. So getting out of your head and into your body is the best thing. Fantastic. And Tom, for those who are listening, they want to know where they can find you. Maybe because I've got a lot of female listeners, maybe they've got partners and they want them to work with someone who can get there. <laughs> and, help them. And, and from that masculine perspective, um, where can we learn more about you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you can listen to our show. That was on the Mind Main podcast, which is, that was a good show. Um, that was, so yeah, I have a podcast, which is the Mind Mate podcast. Uh, my Instagram is probably where I get, you know, most of my um, content up. There's just literally tom.ahern, A-H-E-R-N. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can find links to my books there and um, blog page and things. Amazing. And Tom's got two more books that he's working on now that are going to be out hopefully later this year. Hopefully. <laughs> we get through that writer's block. Um, Tom, thank yes. you so much. I'm going to have all of that info in the show notes as well so that people can click through the links. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you and um, I look forward to having you on another day. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll just we'll just go back and forth. You can come on mine a couple of months and yeah. keep learning from each other. It's good. Really yeah, good. That's great. I'm, I'm in. All right. Done. <laughs>